When it comes down to food industry lies, a lot of it is right smack in the labeling. You see, here's the thing. The FDA only requires certain things to be put on a label, and there's some very fine, fine details that you need to know. So the purpose of this video is to help you understand the biggest food industry lies that you should be aware of, so you can look at a label and understand truly what's going on. I'll break down the science, but I'll also break down the physiology so you understand what's happening in your body, because that's just how I roll. Now, hey, if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button. New videos coming up every single Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday morning morning at 7 a.m. Pacific time, plus some bonus videos here and there. And please hit that bell so you can turn on notifications and know whenever I go live or whenever I post a new video. Okay, the purpose of this video isn't to be a conspiracy theorist, and it's not trying to get you to become one either. What I want to do is simply educate you on a couple of the things that are very, very important to know when it comes down to shopping. Okay, the first one is one that you've probably heard of before, and that's good old-fashioned trans fats. We know trans fats are bad because we hear it all the time, right? Okay, but what we don't know is what's truly A, happening in the body, but B, what's really put on a label. You see, sneaky FDA legality ends up saying that as long as there is a half a gram of trans fat or less in a serving, it doesn't have to be listed on a label. So that means the trans fats that can cause all kinds of issues in our body, which I'll get to in a second, may not even be listed on the food that you're picking up, even the presumably healthy food. You see, the way it works is that we can just adjust serving size. So food companies do that. Let's say, hypothetically, that you look at peanut butter. And one serving of peanut butter being two tablespoons has one gram of trans fats. Well, that obviously would have to be put on a label. But what the food company can do is decrease their serving size down to one tablespoon so that they don't have to put it on a label. Because now, that's only a half a gram of trans fats. They never have to list it now, simply because it's less than a half a gram of trans fat per serving. Keyword being serving. So we're getting manipulated a little bit here. We have to be paying very close attention. So what you need to do is when you go to the grocery store, turn the food around, look at the label, and look for the word hydrogenated. Hydrogenated is the key indicator that it's a trans fat. And what that means is that they've artificially added a hydrogen to an ordinarily healthy fat. So they've taken some kind of vegetable oil, or some cases even a healthier omega-3, and they artificially heat it to a specific point so where they can add a hydrogen into the mix. What this does is it turns it into a saturated fat, giving it a crispier, creamier texture, but also makes it more shelf stable. Well, here's the thing. These trans fats, through this adulteration, end up having the membrane changed. When the fat membrane changes, not only does it become artificially saturated, but it also becomes unable to be processed or acted upon by specific enzymes within the body. This means these fats take exponentially more time to break down. In fact, what is called a CIS fat, which is a typical trans fat, can take up to 51 days to just break down in half. The half-life of the breakdown of a trans fat is 51 days. That means roughly 100 days this thing is sitting in your body, causing issues, building up in plaque. You can see how the cumulative buildup can cause some serious, serious health issues. But if that isn't the worst, it also blocks something known as prostaglandins 1 and 3. Normally, healthy fats block specific prostaglandins, reducing inflammation within the body. Well, trans fats have the opposite. They actually allow these 1 and 3 prostaglandins to be decreased, which means inflammation can overrun your body a lot faster. All right, enough about the fats. Let's talk about whole grains. All right, I'm not going to tell you not to eat carbs just because I'm the keto guy. All right, those of you that watch my videos frequently know that I don't demonize carbs. They have their place. But what I'm not a fan of is whole grains and how they're put on this pedestal like this end-all, be-all, super healthy thing. The reality is whole grains, as far as the labeling goes and the official term, doesn't really mean anything. To be completely honest, we have to understand the entire grain. So we have three parts of the grain. We have the bran, which is the hard outer shell. Then we have the germ. This is the core that eventually sprouts. And then we have what's called the endosperm, which is the starchy center. Okay, so what we have to look at is by, of course, FDA guidelines, a whole grain has to have all three parts of the grain. But only 51% of the food has to have three parts of the grain. That leaves you 49% being able to be refined, being able to be sugar, garbage, and still be called a whole grain because the majority, 51%, is a whole grain. 
Now here's what's even more interesting. When you take a whole grain and you go through any kind of refinement process, any kind of grinding, anything like that, you're losing the fiber and you're losing the nutrient value. So you're ending up with a pseudo whole grain. I know I'm overusing the air quotes here, but it's a lot of it. Okay, we're taking those whole grains and we're just adulterating them and then we only need 51% of them. So it's total garbage. And then the other thing we have to look at is the bran, that outer shell, really isn't all that good for us. Usually the hard outer shells have anti-nutrients in them. They have what are called phytates. These phytates are designed to make it so we don't break those grains down. So we're really not getting the nutrient value anyway. It's there as a protective mechanism. The bran is there to protect. And we think just because it's fiber, that it's good for us because we don't digest it. Well, what about the enzymatic function that that has within our body? It's actually a poison, believe it or not. Not saying you shouldn't eat fiber, but you should really think about it when you're going to eat a whole grain. But this wouldn't be a typical Thomas DeLauer video if I didn't break it down with at least one study. So the Journal of Pediatrics took a look at 12 obese teenagers. They broke them into two groups. Half the group they gave instant oatmeal to. Whole grain, healthy, instant oatmeal. The other group they gave steel cut oats to. The same quantity of calories and the same quantity of fiber. The only difference being that steel cut oats have the whole grain intact and are just split. Steel cut oats by definition are usually where you take a whole grain and you just split it in half. Crack it open so that you can actually access the grain. That's all there is to it. Well what they found is that those that consume the instant oatmeal, even at the same calorie and carb count, ended up consuming 53% more calories in their next meal. Yeah, huge insulin spike, huge glucose spike, leading them to eat more. This is obviously exactly what we're trying to avoid. And of course, we didn't even measure the nutrient extraction, what they are getting out of that food. So be aware of that. Whole grain does not mean it's healthy. You might as well just disregard it. And lastly, I wanna talk about one secret ingredient that's put into a lot of things, and that's known as carrageenan. By now, carrageenan is getting more popular, and I think some of the food companies are realizing that they should probably just leave it out of the equation. But you should know what it is. It's a thickener. It's a non-digestible thickener that's extracted from red seaweed. Now, what it is used to do is to give kind of a creamy consistency to things like uh, some almond butters, nut butters, but also almond milk, cashew milk, all those things. You need to be looking for them. And the interesting thing is, is that pharmaceutical companies will use carrageenan to trigger inflammation within the body to test anti-inflammatories. So let's say they want to test ibuprofen, for example. What they'll do is they'll inject carrageenan into tissue because they know for a fact that it causes massive amounts of inflammation, and then they'll test their ibuprofen to see if it brings the inflammation down. Uh, do the math. It doesn't exactly seem like something you want to be putting in your body just because it's a thickener. It's going to thicken more than just the food. It's probably going to thicken your waistline too. Anyway, guys, this is just a simple breakdown. I do want to make sure that you're keeping it locked here in my channel. I want to make sure that you're tuning in every Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday because I promise you, you won't be disappointed with the amazing content that's coming out. Close to a million subscribers and more can't be wrong. So make sure you join the fun and I'll see you in the next video.